All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have Miss Allie. Is it? It's Irwin, right? Yes. Okay, good. Miss Allie Irwin tonight to share with us on body language and body language for interviewing skills. I'm super excited about this because she has a lot to share. This is her <laughs> niche. This is her kind of um, realm. She's an expert in this area. And I love communication and, and body language because they're so important. And I am looking forward to what she has to share. But first, just a um, general reminder to keep your cameras on so we can see your beautiful faces and yourselves muted unless you have a question or you're answering a question. Again, you can drop questions in the chat to me if you would like. And Allie, I'm going to mute myself and let you introduce yourself and get right on rolling with it. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Oh, thank you for asking. Uh, as Cindy said, my name is Allie Irwin. I am an engineer by training. I went to school for engineering and then worked for GM for about a decade. And then uh, I was home for a while with my kids. And then I did like a whole bunch of other things. And um, <sighs> when Sandy Hook hit, I'm from Michigan and we just had a school shooting. And when Sandy Hook hit, I knew at that time I was at Merrill Lynch and I was doing basically a communications job. And I knew I wanted to do something different that I didn't want to plan lunches for rich people, which sounds, and it was actually super fun, but I was looking for something meatier and, um, I just got obsessed with body language. I had always been kind of a shy extrovert. And I had like been in these worlds where there were like a lot of like rich and powerful people. And I was super curious about all the things like why some people were successful and other people weren't. And so I took all of my engineering school skills and started uh, applying them to like people problems. And that is when I became obsessed with body language. So that is kind of the background. And I'm curious, what do people already know about body language? Like when you, I, there's like a few things like our mothers and our grandmothers have already told us. And I'm curious if anybody, and if you're not comfortable sharing, there's zero pressure. But if you want to tell me like what you think you already know, that'd be awesome. Maybe one more second. Okay, no pressure. All right. Well, I'm sure in this presentation, you are going to see a bunch of things that, that sound familiar. Oh, I can't tell if someone. So the gist of tonight's presentation, I'm doing a PowerPoint, which I know is the kiss of death and probably like, but body language is a super visual medium. And so I pulled lots and lots of pictures so that we can, so I can illustrate like stuff that I want you to start picking up on, like when you're in different situations. And so the gist of tonight's talk is body language for interviews that get offers, but really all interviewing is, is about making a fabulous first impression. That is 99% of your job interview. Like assuming you meet the very basics of what they're looking for, the rest is about making a really great first impression. And because of the age that you guys are, you are still making tons and tons of first impressions on teachers, on like new friends, on potential love interests, on bosses. There's so many first impressions that you're making. And body language is so great because it can so, so much of your first impression is nonverbal. And you can make a better first impression without like working any harder, getting any better grades, being any, like having more clever things to say. Like you, if you just get the body language piece, right. You're going to make such a better first impression that it's like for the effort it takes to do it. It's a really high payoff. 
And the other thing that I want to say today is everything I'm teaching you is science-based. Like I said, when I started out, I'm an engineer by training. And so these aren't like Allie's good ideas or like your grandmother's advice. I have a deep, deep research database of like thousands of articles that talk about and support the principles that we're going to look at tonight. Okay. And I sent Sandy this like summary of how to make a first impression. So she will have this sheet available to you afterwards. So um, I have taught this at colleges around the country, like this specific thing. And so I came up with this first acronym to help students remember it, like in the heat of the moment. So roughly tonight, we're going to talk about the principles of fronting, good eye contact, rehearsing, standing and sitting broadly, and trusting hands. So that's what makes up the acronym. Okay, I want to kick off. So hopefully someone will unmute and answer because I can no longer see chat at all. <laughs> uh, in 30 minutes, if just myself and Sandy were talking, or just me and you were talking, two people, 30 minutes is the length of a lot of standard sort of job interviews. How many nonverbal signals go back and forth? Does anyone, they can type it in the chat, Sandy, you can read it out, like just ballpark, two people, 30 minutes. What do you think? 1,528. Ooh, that's a good answer. That's a really good answer. It's 800. But usually most people guess way low. So I like that you guessed high. That is really, that's impressive. So even if it's only 800, like that's a lot of information back and forth, right? That's a lot of eyebrow flashes and weird hand gestures and things that happen with people's feet. And so there's actually, there's so much information. It's like a whole second language that's being spoken. And I'm sure that you have probably seen or heard the statistic that nonverbal communication is somewhere between 60 and 93% of what we're saying. And that has to do a lot with context and who the communicator is. Are you the strong silent type? Are you chatty? You know, how many words are exchanged and even how expressive you are. But it doesn't even matter whether it's 60 or 93% because both of those numbers are over half. And in fact, if nonverbal signals come in conflict with verbal signals, like if you say you want to do something um, and your voice is saying you don't want to do something, uh, people are going to believe your nonverbal signals 12 to 13 times more than they're going to believe what you say. Okay. And we inherently already know this. If you think about, uh, like if someone was asking, what do you think of the new kid? And you, they said, eh, she's nice, right? That's different than like, ooh, she's nice. Or like, oh, she's nice. Like those are three totally different answers. And the words are exactly the same, right? And so within nonverbal, you could hear all he was shifting there really was voice tone or like, um, uh, you know, how I was saying it. So nonverbal encompasses everything except for the actual words you're saying. And this is, again, this is really important to know because so much of school is about getting the right words. And that is important. But like, I want this one little hour to kind of stand in contrast to all the information you're getting in school about how important it is to say exactly the right words. The right words are really only part of the story. Okay, so next answer. Next question. How long do you think you have to make a first impression? And there's, these answers are all over the board, but there's like a pretty tight scientific range. So there isn't one single right answer. What do you guys think? 0.8 to five seconds. Uh, say that again? 0.8 to five seconds. Yes. That is real, another really good answer. Um, 
science science says somewhere between like five seconds and 30 seconds. So again, even if it's 30 seconds, when you think about walking into a room, like with a new teacher or in a potential job interview, or like the time that it took while Cindy was letting all of you guys in, y'all had already decided what you thought my presentation was going to be like. Before I even said a word, you all had already decided who I was. What, tell me, uh, like, Sandy, tell me, I'll pick on you. Like, what do you think about that? The fact that before I even opened my mouth, everyone that came tonight had already decided whether they thought I was going to be okay or boring or like full of nonsense. <laughs> you're, you're very right. Um, and I think just them being teens, maybe they automatically, even not just on you, but maybe had a thought already, oh, this is going to be, you know, like a class, it's going to be boring, maybe I'm being forced to be here. So maybe not even on you, but just in general, maybe they're having to be here. So they automatically felt that way anyway. It's, it's true. I think this is kind of good news, because in a way, it takes the pressure off, right? Because, like, when you're meeting someone new, again, you don't have to have like that brilliant, opening line or like the first time you raise your hand in class with a teacher, you don't have to say the most brilliant thing because so much of what they're already thinking about you, they've already decided. And like that can sound bad, but I think it's freedom because if you nail that first impression, if you pay attention to those first few minutes that you meet, the first 30 seconds, five to 30 seconds that you meet someone, that's not that long that you have to pay attention to the impression that you're making. And that impression really endures. Our first impressions, like most of what happens after, especially like the first five minutes, is everything reinforces what they're already believing about you. Unless you give them new information or context to help them see why that first impression wasn't accurate. So I think it's good news. <laughs> I'm going to choose to interpret this, this information as good news. Okay, I already answered that. And so we're going to play a little game now. Uh, it's called the TED Talk game. I've been playing this game since I created this video in like 2014. And I checked the statistics before we get on tonight for the answer. And the answer is held consistently for the past seven years. So I'm going to show you two speakers, seven seconds of their TED Talk. TED Talks, I don't know. Do people know what TED Talks are? Yes. Okay, good. So what I love about TED Talks is everyone that's in the TED Talk, right, is a subject matter expert. They have prepped for months for these speeches. And so they're really great A-B comparisons. And both of these particular TED Talks are body language experts speaking on the same topic. So this is like a really strong A-B comparison. And I want you to watch the, the seven second clips and decide whose video gets more views. And think about like, I wonder like what, how many more views, like twice as many, three times as many. Okay, so here we go. And hopefully the sound works. There shouldn't be sound yet. Okay. When you meet someone and you're talking to somebody. Okay, seven seconds is fast, right? Good morning. Before we kick off, let's get a bit of light in the room, guys, so I can see the face. All right. Now, I'm going to have to have Sandy report. Show of hands, because I can't see now on Galley View. Like, I can only see, like, three of you. Show of hands, who thinks it was the first guy got more views? And who thinks it was the second guy? Okay, Sandy, what were the results? 
So one didn't answer and the okay. rest of them said the second guy. Okay. Does someone, okay. See someone's hand up. Do you want to guess how many more views? Like, is it factor? Yeah. Um, any, okay. Yep. Probably 3,000 more, maybe. Like close to 12 times as many views. 12, the one guy, so the first guy got uh, 412,000 views. And the second guy got 6 million. So that's not quite the 12 times. I didn't have time to quite do the math. Maybe you guys are all better at math than I am because it's been a long time since I was in engineering school, but whatever, um, 6 million divided by 400,000, it's close to 12 times. And it's, it's that statistic that I talked about in the beginning, how it's the same content, but the one guy, like his first impression is so much stronger that his video has gotten 12 times as many views, 400,000 to 6 million. Okay. What did, does anyone want to say anything that they noticed about the second guy versus the first guy? Cindy, you can go ahead and call on people if anyone answered. <laughs> Allie, you raised your hand. Uh, yeah. So the second dude has like more positive, like energy and like he's very open with his body language. And the first dude, he was like, not closed off, but he wasn't like opening the audience to him. And the second guy also had, um, his pitch was higher and he was like, um, he was humanizing himself. Yeah. And those are really great positive energy. It's interesting because it's a catch all term for that thing that we feel when we're around certain people. And one of the things that I love about body language is it like codifies it. it like it gives us a structure to understand like, what is it that that person's doing that's making us feel more positive energy? It's like, um, you know, it's like a scientific observation of that catch-all term positive energy, but that's exactly what it is. He's saying like, I'm so glad that I'm here. Like, let's get the lights up so that I can see you, which is funny because I, in my slide view, can't speaker view people, like can't see you all. <laughs> Did anyone else want to say something that they noticed? Okay. So, uh, yeah, we're going to skip these. Yep. These are the old stats. Sorry. Okay. One more pitch about how much difference it makes. This really famous guy, Frank Benieri, he did this thing called thin slicing where he took job interviews. He took and he taped them and he showed the 20 minute interviews to like professional HR people to look at these three characteristics, warmth, competence, and confidence. And warmth and competence are the two axes, axes that in job interviews and in teaching and in um, so many areas in life, warmth is, does this person wanna help me? And competence is, can this person help me? And so those are like, those are two things that they, that people are always evaluating other people on. Can they help? And do they want to help? Do they care about me? And can they help me? And so they coded the people after like watching the whole interview. And then he kept slicing the interviews down and having different people code them until he coded just the first 20 seconds, which again is just that time where the person like walks into the interview room, shakes hands and sits down. And the results were exactly the same. So hopefully I have sold you. And this, that research has been um, repeated with concert violinists and with TED Talks and with job interviews and with teacher evaluations and like across all of the industries, 
the numbers are the same. So hopefully I've sold you and that this stuff is worth learning. It's worth learning now and then using for the rest of your life. Okay. Uh, Ali said open versus closed, which was a really good observation. That was a really, um, really good observation. And so the first principle of making a good first impression is the idea of being open to your audience. And this is the same whether you're on Zoom or whether or not you're in person. Like if I was kind of always cheated and like outward and looking over my shoulder and focusing on my notes, you get the impression that you are less important than whatever is happening over here. And you can see this, um, photographers use this principle when they're taking political photographs. Everyone uses this principle, but I think these political photographs illustrate it. These photographs were put out by like Obama positive uh, media outlets. And these photos, whoops, are, were put out by like, um, Obama unfriendly outlets. These photos were used in articles that were, um, you know, maybe complaining about a policy he had or complaining about a speech that he had done. And you'll notice not just the fact that he has a more serious facial expression, but the fact that they, all of those photos have changed his body language. They're kind of non-verbally saying that he's not paying attention to you, that his policies aren't for you. And so the, the fronting idea when you're in person is you want your head, your torso, and your toes all pointed towards the person that you're talking to. And so on Zoom, obviously you, no one can see your feet. <laughs> But the idea of having your head and your body pointed towards the camera is the same because non-verbally you're saying like, I'm giving you all of my attention. And even if you go back to like our caveman brains, you're like exposing your vital organs to the person that you're having the conversation with. We feel safer. Uh, this guy discovered that we feel safer when we view them straight on. And we feel part of why we feel safer is that idea of exposing, you know, like if you were going to come after me, like I'm less protected this way. But also when we see people face on, then we see more of their, like all of their nonverbals. We see more hand gestures. We see more of their facial expression. And so um, Karamov noted that when we um, see people straight on all of those things, which you can already read. So you think that this is really obvious, but I have a couple of pictures from job, job interviews and you can see like just looking, uh, the guy on the, this side of the screen talking to the blue shirt, you can see what he's trying to do there. Well, can anyone say what they think the guy is trying to do on that side of the screen? Anyone? Jake, go ahead. You're raising your hand. It looks like he looks like he tried to communicate with the other people. Yeah, yeah, like he's trying to include that woman. You can see kind of almost like they made a little circle with their feet. He's trying to simultaneously front both this guy and that woman, which is which is what you do if there's more than one person you're trying to front. If the woman wasn't engaged, I would encourage him to cheat back towards the gentleman. But what he's doing there is he's, is he's trying to front both of them at the same time by giving them both like as much of his front as he can. And then the, the women, the, the woman talking to the woman in red, it's interesting, like that's a classic front you know, where they are directly talking to each other. And you can see that the third woman that's kind of trying to get into the conversation, you can tell by her body language that she can't decide whether or not she's welcome in this conversation. 
you can see even like even as much as her shoulders are kind of half in and half out like she can't decide whether to like be all in or whether to wait you can see that her foot that back foot is even more turned out and feet are really fascinating because they're so far away from like we think about controlling our face and hands and we don't think about what our feet are doing and if you are ever in a group and you wonder like what someone's intentions are if you look at their feet our feet point where we want to go and so clearly this woman um in the white can't wait to get out of there she like she's uncomfortable and she like can't wait to move on so oh sorry so that is a gist of fronting does anyone have any questions like when i first heard this i thought it sounded like it wouldn't make a difference but the more that you observe gatherings the more that you observe people out noticing in groups who everyone is fronting towards tells you who the alpha in the group is and the alpha in the group isn't always the person that has the most status like sometimes it's not the teacher sometimes there's another person in the class that actually has more power than even the person that seems like they would be at the top of the food chain and understanding that information it's just it's like a cheat code like you you understand so much about how the power dynamics are without you know like especially when you're new to a situation okay any questions okay so start noticing this when you see pictures Start noticing what you think they're trying to say with the angle of the person's body to the camera. Okay, eye contact. About all y'all have already heard, make good eye contact. Show of hands, how many people's mothers have said, make good eye contact. Yeah, yeah, what does it even mean, right? Like what is good eye contact? What, what defines make good eye contact? Does anyone have any idea? Or why, why does it even matter? Thoughts? Allie, go ahead, you're raising your hand. Um, well, eye contact, um, it's really important for a conversation because it tells the person you're either talking to or listening to that you're fully in the conversation. And when you break the eye contact, it shows that you're distracted or you're paying attention to someone else. And people always say that eyes are the windows to the soul. So if you're making eye contact with them, it also shows that you're connected on another level and like you're actually want to be in the conversation. Excellent. Excellent. The, all true. So I'm gonna give you like the up level because y'all know that already. So I'm gonna give you the up level. There are three kinds of eye contact. There is power gazing, social gazing, and intimate gazing. <laughs> power gazing is when you're looking kind of, like our eyes don't actually just look directly into other people's eyes. Like if you've ever had anyone stare directly into your eyes for a whole bunch of times, like it's kind of, like it's kind of a lot. Our eyes, in general, trace patterns on people's faces. And they have discovered this by like, you know, high tech eye motion cameras during interviews and conferences and all of this. And what they have decided, what they've coded is that when you're making eye contact on the upper third of someone's face, which is kind of eye, eye, forehead, that is power gazing. That is the gaze that leaders use when they talk about people being super charismatic. Those people most typically are power gazing. And what we do with our friends and peers is social gazing, which is sort of the lower two thirds of the face. And again, it sounds like is this something that people really do? And the answer is yes. Like I have been in meetings where I felt like I wasn't getting the respect. People weren't listening to my ideas in the way that I wanted them to. And I shifted on purpose to power gazing. Like all I did was bring my, bring my gaze up and it shifted the tone of our conversations. 
And so like, I didn't have to be confrontational. I didn't have to like make a stink about the fact that no one was listening to me. All I had to do was shift my eye contact and it made a difference. Intimate gazing is exactly what it sounds like. It is eye, eye, super sternal notch. So it's not all the way down, but it's, it's to this part. And this is what we do with people that we are interested in romantically. So uh, if you've ever been in a situation where you, someone like made you feel uncomfortable, like someone was creepy, a lot of what they're doing is they're using, and you, and you can't figure out what it is. Like they haven't said anything specific, but there's just something that feels off. A lot of the time what they're doing unconsciously is intimate gazing. And so if you notice someone using the wrong, like intimate gazing in a situation that is no go, you shift up to power gazing, which again, is just a really easy nonverbal signal. Like I'm not interested in you in that way. Okay. So little interview skills, little dating skills all wrapped into one. The appropriate amount of eye contact is somewhere in the two thirds range. Okay. Below 60%, it's considered avoidant. That's, and actually, if you want to end a conversation, like breaking eye contact is not a terrible way to do it. Like just stop giving them your attention with your eyes. And that helps them understand that the conversation, like you are ready to move on. And above 70% is creepy. It's too much. It actually feels kind of intrusive when someone stares too directly at us. So most people hit this very naturally. Okay. The other thing with eye contact, which I don't have a slide for, is when we make eye contact with other people, it releases oxytocin in our brain and in their brain. And oxytocin is, um, it's the chemical feeling of connection. Okay. Oxytocin happens, um, on teams. It happens in families and when you are making direct eye contact with someone, like I said, it releases a chemical in your brain and in their brain, and it helps you feel like you both want to cooperate with each other. So it's a little, little hack. Okay. Rehearsing before a job interview is pretty standard advice, right? I don't know. Have you guys all, have any of you guys interviewed for a job? Has anyone done that yet? I don't know how old you all are. No one's yet done that yet. That looks like Hi. a bunch of head shaking nose. Nose. Is there any other situation like tryouts maybe, or before, um, if you had to give a speech in class or anything that's presentation-y? They're shaking some heads. Yes, for those. Okay. Perfect. All of these same things work for that as well. Rehearsing, like you don't need me to tell you to practice. So I'm going to give you like a couple of extra reasons why rehearsing matters. Okay. When ignore the top of the slide and just focus on, uh, has anyone ever had that experience where you're thinking about someone and they call or text, nobody calls anymore, text, or like you, you, um, maybe if you're older and you're like thinking, like, like you're really interested in car, like, for example, my, my husband and I just bought a car and I, it's a Honda Insight, which is the electric, the hybrid. And I had never seen Honda Insights until I bought one. And now I see them everywhere. That's Bader Meinhof. And that is the idea that we get, we see, physically see what we look for. And so before anything, anything like presentations or any of those situations, we always have selective attention. We're like, we're always not taking in all the information around us. So Part of rehearsing is to practice ahead of time, noticing things that you want to see. Like, for example, um, 
if you all were up on my screen, I would be focusing my selective attention on the people who seemed really into what I was saying. Or if, um, uh, like anything where you're nervous, you want to direct your attention towards the things that you actually want to see. And if you do that, it will help you. It like creates an upward spiral because you'll notice like the one nice thing they said instead of the like one bad thing that they said. And it gives you more confidence when you're going into situations because our brains naturally notice the negative things more than the positive things. And so we wanna use our brains on purpose to look for the positive things in order to keep us calm when we're doing presentations. Has anyone ever like in a presentation in class seen someone like get nervous and then like totally get flustered and then forget what they were saying and then like, like that sort of thing. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. In those moments, like that's happened to all of us. <laughs> In those moments, you really want to intentionally use your selective attention to focus, to look for something good. Okay. You want to practice ahead of time, even even like, oh, I'll probably get nervous up there. And if I get flustered, I'm just going to focus on my friend's face. Or I'm just going to focus on the poster in the back of the room. Or I don't know what the Zoom equivalent is. Hopefully you all are in in-person school now. But pre part of rehearsing is knowing that maybe you're going to get nervous ahead of time and like practicing what it is you're going to focus on when you do. Okay. Uh, selective attention, our brains, our pattern recognition machines, like whatever we think is true. Like, I think that person hates me. Then I notice how they're always sighing when I'm around. If I think that person loves me, then I notice when they're laughing. And like the person is honestly always doing all of those things. And what we think is what we see. The other reason that you want to rehearse is we have micro expressions and I'm going to cover just three of them. Sandy, how are we at for time? You're good. You have a little over 20 minutes left. Okay. There are micro expressions. Let me go back because that is distracting to look at. Actually, let me take you off. Stop share. Uh, see, I could be panicking right now because I cannot find my mouse and I cannot go off. Stop share. Mm, there we go. Okay. Micro expressions are, has anyone heard of micro expressions? Like show of hands, has anyone heard of them? Paul Ekman, lie to me. Did you ever watch that, Sandy? It's really good. Yeah, um, micro expressions, Paul, Paul Ekman, long time ago, discovered that people flash micro expressions, which are like their true feelings that they don't want you to know about, okay? If I'm smiling, I'm like, hey, everybody, like, I don't care that you know that I'm happy. Like, I want you to know that I'm happy because I'm holding this expression for a long time. But if you've ever like uh, told another friend some bad news and notice that they flash a smile for just a second, maybe not a friend, maybe a friend of me, and it's just a second, like you almost don't even see it, but you kind of get the sense that they're not they're not unhappy for you that like whatever the thing is most often what you're noticing are these micro expressions that are like between like a 16th of a second so they're just super fast but we do them all the time and there are seven of them that are universal like papua new guinea italy south korea united states Different countries have different levels of expressiveness. If any of you have like um, friends that talk with their hands a lot, or um, I have some friends that are from cultures that are much less, um, like they don't make as much eye contact. They're very self-contained cultures. Even those people flash micro expressions. So there's seven of them. There's Happiness, sadness, fear, anger, disgust, contempt, 
And what's the seventh? Happy, sad, fear, anger, sadness, disgust, and contempt. One of them is good. One of them is a surprise. Did I say surprise? Okay, that's the seventh one. Okay, we're going to cover three because those are the reasons, especially that you want to rehearse before something big. Okay, so let's go back to screen share. All right, play. The first one is fear. Fear happens when our eyes shoot up out of the way. And uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, we're trying to, our eyes are like literally trying to see more of the situation. So um, the, the biggest indication is that upper whites of the eyes, but also the mouth is open and the lips are stretched back. So it's like, oh, it's like, or like if you're going to yell. Fear is evolutionary. Like if you flash fear in a situation, other people are very prone to pick up on your feeling of, of fear because like if something is going on, I used to live in New York and like you would see a fear micro expression, like go through a subway car. Like if like before the thing that was happening, even like got down here you, you could see like a ripple of fear. Fear is a super contagious emotion because we want to stay safe. And so when you get caught off guard and you flash fear, other people very likely pick up on it. Okay. Can anyone think of a situation where like noticing someone else's fear even if they didn't want you to know they were afraid would be useful. Anyone? Anyone? No? You have something? If there was a deadly threat coming. Yeah. Yeah, like if somebody saw something and they were even like micro expressions are important. Like if somebody saw something and yet they didn't want to speak up. If you caught their fear micro expression, that would heighten your own alertness to look around and see what was happening. It's a great example. If you asked somebody to do something, like if in, they had already promised that they were going to do it, and then you asked them about it, like, again, like, did you do the thing? And they flashed fear and then told you that they had done the thing that would be another situation like that little fear flash like oh no i didn't do it then like you would have more information about what to actually expect uh do you have any friends that are gullible <laughs> i'm gullible <laughs> learning to spot these helps me be less gullible okay that's fear you can just see how the whites of their, her eyes, of both of their eyes pop up. These are um, LinkedIn profile pictures. Y'all probably don't even know what LinkedIn. It's like, um, I don't know, Facebook for work, Instagram for work. These are fear micro expressions in people's profile pictures. You can see like the woman in the gray suit, my friend Heather from book club, She's showing fear in her LinkedIn profile picture. That is not someone who was feeling super confident about having her picture taken. And she shows like she doesn't, like if I were hiring a real estate agent and I were only looking at these pictures, like there's something about her that just doesn't look that confident. Okay, so you'll start to notice fear expressions again in photographs. That's a great way to practice. Okay. Happiness. Y'all, can you spot true happiness versus fake happiness? Most people are pretty good at this. Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. I'm going to move on. If you are um, in a situation, first impression situation, and you see a micro expression of true happiness, maybe, um, you know, you said something and they just had like a little flash of happiness. That's a great opportunity to build rapport with the person that you're talking to. You want to share that moment of happiness with them, like give them a second to even revel in like whatever it was that just happened to increase your feelings of connection. And the third one is contempt. Contempt is rampant in social media. <laughs> it's that passive aggressive half smile smirk. Most people, this is the most misunderstood micro expression because it looks like quasi happiness because it looks like a half smile, but it is most definitely not. And the contempt doesn't have to be directed at you. The contempt oftentimes is like about something else in the situation, but it's important to recognize when you see it, that it's not happiness. And it's important to not show it if you um, are in any of the situations that we've talked about already, like stay away from that half smile because even if intellectually we think it looks like happiness, it doesn't read to our core like happiness. Okay. Again, these are people's profile pictures in LinkedIn. This woman is an acting coach. The woman on the, um, she's on my right side is a terrible LinkedIn profile picture. And um, this guy, uh, again, another friend. <laughs> I'm laughing because all my friends' pictures are in here because I feel comfortable using them. Like he's super sarcastic and that's part of his brand. And he doesn't care if people know that he's super sarcastic. He's like super good at what he does. He has his pick of jobs. And, but you can see how his smile is like just a little bit bigger on one side than on the other side. Jeff Bezos, I think may actually have some kind of facial paralysis. I don't really know that much about him, but he shows contempt all the time. He shows like this half smirky smile literally all the time. And it does like, I don't love how I feel when I look at his pictures. Okay. We're going to skip all that. Oh, here's, here's contempt. Do you think you've done anything wrong? Little video. On the advice of counsel. Sorry. And it, I slowed it down so you can see it because it's really fast. Do you see how like it looks like he doesn't know how to work his face? Do you think you've got So those three micro expressions, if you just learn those three and start to use those effectively, notice when people are flashing fear so that you know to get more information about a situation. Notice when people are flashing happiness, but not actually like holding it for longer periods of time. Because again, the difference between a micro and a macro is just how expression is, how long someone's holding it. And using that as an opportunity to build rapport with the person that you're talking to. So fear gives you more information. Happiness builds rapport. And contempt, just staying away from contempt and noticing when other people are flashing contempt. Like just learning those three will be a big help. Okay, we are getting close on time. So I'm going to stop sharing and just tell you verbally the last few. What Ali said in the beginning about that person's open, broad body language, when Alan walked on stage, you know, his arms were loose, Whereas Scott's, he was actually, I think, having trouble with his remote. You could see he was kind of like curled down and looking at his remote. Standing and sitting broadly, taking up physical space, communicates to the other person your confidence. And one of the places, and I have tons and tons of pictures that we are out of time to see, but you can definitely see on your own. If you watch, if you look at any reporting about athletics, any athlete that's ever won anything is like, yes, yes. And there's like, you know, some kind of like touchdown dance or 
um, I think of like, especially the people that win in track and field that go across the tape with their arms up at the end, you can see like they are physically taking up a whole bunch of space. Whereas any defeated athlete crumbles, you see them like sitting on the sidelines and they're kind of like in a little ball on the sidelines. The problem with uh, how most of us wait for anything now is that we wait on our phones. And if you like, it's hard to see cause I'm, you know, but like if you're curled in and on your phone, this is more of that defeated posture than if you're open, okay? Knowing that and knowing that you just have to do it for the length of time to make that first impression, it's really worth it if you can to either have your phone out off to the side, because you can see I'm still open and like looking at my phone, but just not curling down into like a C because subconsciously we associate that with people who are defeated, with people you know, who have just lost something. And in that first impression window, you wanna look more like the person who's strong and confident in yourself, okay? So just open, square shoulders, loose arms. Again, like if you wanna look at your phone, have it off to the side. But even if you're coming into a new situation, if you can not be on your phone for the length of time to make that impression, it really actually does make a difference. And the last T is trusting hands. You'll notice through most of this presentation, my hands have been visible. Our brains don't like it when we can't see other people's hands. There's some part of our brain that wonders like our caveman brains wonders like if they're making a fist or if they have a weapon or if they're hiding something. And so in a Zoom call is great if people can see your hands. And um, if you're waiting for something, again, that first impression, if you're waiting like at the front of the room to start your presentation, a lot of, there's two postures that people use when they're waiting. Um, They'll hide their hands this way, or they'll um, hide their hands this way while they're waiting. And if you can just have your hands loose and at your side, it feels super weird, but it actually doesn't look weird at all. And it gets you started using your hands in your, in your presentations which makes your presentations more interesting. It makes people trust your information more and it makes them more interesting. Okay, that is the gist of what I have. I have seven minutes to spare. Woohoo! So now I want to, I want to, I can show pictures or I can just answer questions. Does anyone have any questions? If you don't, it's totally fine. I have a really quick question. Let's hear it. Um, you mentioned earlier that when we're making eye contact with somebody, the yes. chemicals are released for each of us. And during this year and a half, almost two years of COVID, so much has been virtual. Does that same chemical get released yes. for virtual? Yes, it's nuts. So I do um, two things. One, I do a lot of presentation skills training. Like I prep people who have big presentations coming and I will have them print out a picture of the person like that they most want to impress. So like, for example, I had someone who was giving this big talk. Um, there were probably going to be 400 people there, but the owner of her company was the person like she most wanted to impress. And so I had her print out his LinkedIn picture and put it up on the wall. And in her practicing of the speech, she practiced giving this talk to him. And so even if like you're on a Zoom call and the other person doesn't have their video on and you do, if you pull up their LinkedIn profile picture and literally make eye contact with their picture, it won't do anything for them. They will have totally missed out but you will feel more warmth towards them 
and that will convey in your voice and it still works. Isn't that nuts? That's really cool. Yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions? You got seen anything that you wonder about the body language? No. All right. Oh, Allie. Okay. So if I was going to like start a presentation and I was standing with my hands, like, um, like this, like right here, but you could see them. Is that like, yep, still that would work. work? Yep. That like would work. It's interesting though, that I don't want you to stay like that to start. Absolutely. So you're waiting to start. That's absolutely, that's a great posture. What you don't want to do is, um, stay like this the whole time. I don't know if you've ever noticed, um, you'll start noticing all of these things in interviews. Sometimes when the person being interviewed is nervous, they'll wring their hands or they'll like kind of almost pet themselves, which is what we do. Like when we're comforting, like, you know, like a puppy or a baby and you'll notice, or they'll even uh, like rub their legs, which you can't see. I can't get far enough back in this room um, for you to see, but they'll like, they'll like stroke themselves or they'll play with their necklace. So this is a great way to start. You just, once you're talking, just use like really neutral hand gestures. And when you're hand gesturing in a presentation, if you think about a box, that's kind of like, um, I don't know like neck to hip and then maybe 18 inches, like almost like put your arms out straight, kind of like this size and keep your gestures inside this box. You'll come across as really natural and polished and way more interesting because our brains are like tiny toddlers. We are very easily distracted and motion helps our brain pay attention. And so in your presentation, you can use hand gestures, like say, I have two things to talk about, I have two main points, or um, they really grew over the year. See how like I'm showing that something got bigger. If you use hand gestures in your presentations, it makes your presentations so much more interesting, again, without doing any more work on the words. <laughs> it's like a little bonus. Okay, anything else? No, I like your name, by the way. Oh, thank you. Another alley. There aren't that many of us. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to give this exact, almost exact presentation. I was telling Sandy tomorrow to loan officers, mortgage loan officers, people who, um, you know, like help people get mortgages. And uh, one of the dudes that's going to be in the talk tomorrow closes $500 million worth of loans a year. And there's in, like six people on the call. It's going to be about the size. And like, I just want you to know that this information actually matters. Like people who make big, big money use these principles in order to develop relationships and like the focus of tomorrow is primarily over Zoom calls. These are people who are prospecting. They're trying to meet people and trying to get business over Zoom calls. And so all of the things that we talked about today, I'm going to teach them. And so like just try one or two of the things that we talked about tonight, like a little experiment, because this stuff really does matter. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Allie, for being here tonight with us. We, I greatly appreciated it. And I believe, I know I got a lot out of it. And I believe that they all did as well. Um, so Good. if you guys do think of any questions later, feel free to email me and I can get them over to Allie. I'm sure she'd be more than happy to, to answer them later. I know a lot of times when you get off of a call or something, you're like, oh, I should have asked that. So feel free to reach out and we'll get those questions answered for you. Absolutely. Alrighty, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Have a good one. Bye.